April. Um, Sign-ups are closed, so if you haven't signed up, sorry. Uh, but if you have signed up, you can now register your team. Uh, so if you check the guidebook app, and there is a how-to item in the in the guide section. There's a there's three different how-to items on how to get that set up. Uh, and so you can go ahead and do that. Uh, there's a link that you click. You hop onto the chat to the board. You log in and create an account, and then you per you confirm your email. And then you have to create a team to keep your account. If you don't have a team, um, you'll have to re-enter the competition list, just so you know. Uh, and if you have any questions while you're doing it, please ask in Slack. Um, I don't want to walk through the entire thing, because uh, I think that's a waste of time. But if you have any questions, we are available on Slack. Uh, you can also ping me on Guidebook. I'm not going to answer it back, because it doesn't give me a notification. If you ping at Kulinix, K-U-L-N-I-C-S, in Slack, or anyone, um, You'll get, a, you'll get a response back way quicker. So if you have any questions, just click there. Um, other than that, any questions? Nope. Oh. All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome back. Um, this week, we are going to be discussing domain hacking and pivoting. Um, sort of similar to what we were doing last week due to some unanticipated circumstances, we didn't quite get through the whole presentation. So um, we're going to, I'm going to go over some stuff again, but I'm going to try to go a little bit quickly through some of the reviews so I can get into the cool uh, hacky stuff with you guys. But anyways. So yeah, as always, this is how you can get in touch with us. Um, so there's a sign-in sign sheet over there. Side note, if you haven't signed in, please do. It helps us a bunch. And uh, if you are interested, check uh, Add to Mailing List so that we can spam you. And um, you can reach our website is csg.utdallas.edu. We post these presentations up there. We also record these presentations uh, and post the videos up there. And we also stream in, in case um, in case you can't make it one of these weeks. Uh, our stream is twitch.tv slash utdcsg. Also, we're on Slack. We're cool enough to have our own channel, hashtag CSG. Um, it's probably the quickest way to get in touch with the group and uh, the officers. So if you're not on uh, UTD Slack, I highly recommend that you check that out. And then, of course, you can email us at utdcsg.gmail.com. OK, announcements. Uh, Nick already took care of the, the State Farm stuff. But uh, as always, every Thursday at 4 PM, we host Lab Hangouts. And Basically, we open up our lab, which is at ECS South 4.619. And um, basically, we invite people to come chill, talk some security stuff. We have some officers that will be around, um, maybe working on things, maybe just hanging out. And, we, and if you have questions, or if you have a cool topic to, that you want to chat about, or otherwise just want to chill with us, um, I, I promise we're, we're generally friendly. Um, I totally encourage you guys to, to come to those. For the last couple of weeks, I've been doing a couple of demos. Um, but my idea going forward is to, like, generally at those things, I'm going to be working on a hack the box, um, which a hack the box problem, which is basically a virtual puzzle related to security. And I, and I would uh, totally love it if I got some enthusiasts to come and we could, like, collaborate on that stuff. I think it'd be really cool. But. Uh, Anyways, so, um, so yeah, domains and hacking. This is generally what we're going to go over. Uh, I'm going to again. I'm going to start with sort of a refresher, but I'm going to try to focus on the conceptual stuff and maybe uh, not go terribly deep in some of the technical stuff. Really, what I want to do is get a very solid idea of how what what's a domain, how does it work, how does the authentication work, and if you get a good grasp on that sort of thing you're going to have a much easier time understanding a lot of the attacks that uh, attackers are going to use against a domain and, and have a much easier time defending against those attacks. So yeah, let's jump into it. Domains. So what is a domain? Um, if you guys have been with us over the course of the semester, you know, you probably know what a network is. You know you've got a bunch of machines that are connected together and can route traffic and talk to each other. Um, domain is a little bit different. It's a little bit. Uh, more stuff on added on to that. Oh, by the way, we're going to be focusing on Windows domains. I'm sorry for the Linux like diehard fanboys, but uh, Google uh, Samba if you're that interested. <laughs> but um, so basically, a domain is sort of like a suite of softwares 
that serve the purpose of organizing a bunch of computers on a network. Essentially, you, you, you uh, bunch your computers up in a hierarchical structure, and, it, and you uh, pass and you manage them through this software to make things make life much easier. So, some key terms that I want to uh, mention: there's the domain controller or the DC, which is you could think of as like the top dog of the uh, of the domain. They they push out uh, rules. They tell other computers what to do, and it deals with all of the authentication, which is really important. Um, so if you don't have a domain controller, you don't really have a domain because you can't get people to authenticate and work together. Organizational units are a way to sort of logically group things together within the domain. Uh, a similar concept is groups. They, they, um, they serve to sort of organize all of the stuff inside of a domain. And then another important uh, term is group policy objects, or GPOs. And basically, these are policies that you apply to any of the th things in the domain to tell it how to you want it to behave. And OUs and groups are used to uh, that the the way you organize with your OUs is corresponds to how GPOs are going to be applied. So. Um, and then everything else on a domain, you have basically all of your net, you have your users and you have network resources. You can pretty much split everything into one of those two cate categories. Um, so you, you're a company and you have users that you want access to your domain and you want them to be able to work with a lot of the services you provide. You're, that you want them to be able to work on their workstations and access the email server, web server, all that stuff. Here's a nice visual. Um, as you can see, it's supposed to be sort of like a hierarchical structure. You can imagine that at the tippy top is probably the uh, domain controller. Um, I don't know why, like whenever you look up uh, domains, the primary example of the service that you're sharing is printers. Like you can, you can share any service you want. I guess printers are really common, but, but yeah. I don't know, it's weird to me, but anyways. So, a good analogy, I think, is to think of a, a domain sort of like an army. Think of the network as sort of like a military base. Okay, and domain is and a domain is all the stuff that's on that military base. You got your troops, your supplies, your vehicles, whatever. And you have the domain controller, which you can sort of think of as the top dog, biggest officer who's shouting orders and and making all the big decisions. And then you have OUs to sort of organize different groups or, or branches, and GPOs are those rules and orders that are getting shouted out at everyone. Um, this analogy falls a little bit short because the, the DC, the top dog, does more than just shout orders. It also authenticates everyone. So if you had to, whenever you talked to someone, had to first talk to the big chief guy, that would be more accurate. But anyways, you guys get the idea. So why do we care? Um, why is this important? Well, let's say you're on the defender side. You need, you're trying to set up a, uh, your, your network. So why do you want your company to have a domain? Well, it's for a similar reason to why you want your military to have an organized army and not just a bunch of dudes with rifles, right? Um, organization is good. It's you, it um, is much more efficient that way. And uh, another important key here is that not all users are created equal. So you're a company, and you need to get some work done. And you, and you're, you the company, bought like 100 computers, and you need your workers to be able to use some of these computers. You don't want to let your workers do like own those computers. You don't want to let them do anything they want with those computers. Um, domains are a, are a very convenient solution to controlling what users can do. And, like, and being very specific with what privileges you give them. You generally don't want you know, Olga from accounting to have the same access to your domain controller that the IT admin does. You know? uh, so domains will help control that. So why do you as an attacker care about this presentation? Um, well, A, domains are really common. If you're in the penetration testing business, this is going to be a very key uh, concept that you're go going to need to be familiar with. Um, and also, let's go back to that analogy. So, so that, that network is the uh, military base, and the domain is all the stuff on that military base. You could think about, like, if you're connected to the network, it's not all like, excuse me, it's not unlike being on the military base. Like maybe you jumped the fence and now you're on the military base. 
whereas being on the domain is sort of like being on the military base and having a uniform as disguise. Okay, there's a certain amount of trust there. You become part of the group. And uh, so your ultimate goal as an attacker is to you know, get onto the military base, make people trust you, and be able to impersonate that big top dog that's shouting orders at everyone. Basically, number one goal, compromise the DC, and then you can control everybody. You have your, the army of this company at your disposal. And now this slide seems really boring, uh, but, sorry, I forgot to mention. So yeah, you guys can ask questions. You can totally interrupt me, and uh, I'll try to my best to answer your question, if it's like a serious question. And if you just want to try to make it, me crack up, then you can use the, uh, the uh, online tool there. But uh, yeah, as is traditional. But anyways, so single sign-on. This seems like a boring concept, but it's actually very key to understand some of the vulnerabilities with a domain's authentication process. So what is single sign-on? So basically, so you got a user, your, uh, your employee, and you don't want to make them give their credentials every time they access any network resource. Now on Windows, everything looks clean, everything looks put together really nice, everything's flowing, and it doesn't really show you exactly how much you're talking to other machines on the network. Uh, th you, you, okay, you, you'd think like, oh, I'm going to a web server, okay, I'd have to log in there. On top of that, whenever you're accessing a network share, whenever you're uh, authenticating, just any time you're talking to anyone else on the network, basically, you'd have to re-enter your credentials. And employees don't like that, and uh, companies don't like that, because that's very inefficient, and it takes a lot of time, and it's very tedious. So instead, the solution is, a single sign-on method. And basically, you want your user to be able to enter their credentials once, and then for as long as they're logged in, they can talk to anybody else in the domain, and it's totally fine, everything flows nice, and you get the nice, clean Windows experience that you have today. And that sounds great, but there's a couple of key points about the implementation that you need to be aware of. For example, user logs into onto their computer with credentials, those credentials get hashed, um, and those that hash gets stored in the memory on their computer. Without this, it would be impossible to do single sign-on, unless you were storing clear text credentials, which is even worse. So uh, in order to have this nice, shiny, awesome thing called single sign-on, you have to have a token that represents them in stored in memory on their computer. And uh, the end result is that these hashes of user credentials get left around uh, on computers on the domain. And why that's important, we will get to very soon. Okay, so now I want to like give a, a fairly in-depth look at uh, how authentication generally works on a domain. Again, specifically a Windows domain. And there are two main protocols. One is called NTLM uh, and one is called Kerberos. First with NTLM, it's the older of the two different authentication protocols. So basically what happens is user enters their credentials, they get hashed, you, you give that hash of, the, uh, of their credentials to the domain controller, domain controller checks, are you on my list? Yeah, you are, all right, you're good. User logs in, and that hash gets stored on their computer. So, um, and whenever they try to use network resources, maybe they're accessing a remote file share or whatever, uh, they give that hash to the domain controller. Rather than having the user say, what's your password again? I forgot. It will look into memory, grab that hash, and just transparently in the background, go to a domain controller and say, hey, this guy's uh, asking for this. Here's his hash. And once again, the domain controller will check, all right, are you on my list? Yes. Are you allowed to access that? Yes, etc." And so another little analogy, there's, you got a toy box of network resources. Uh, th for whatever reason, the toy box has a bouncer, and that's the Domain controller, user gives their, their hash, gives the DC their hash, got to check if, if he's on the list, check if he's allowed to use that toy. If so, cool. Let him have it. And now a brief overview of Kerberos. It's a little bit different. Rather than being all about hashes, it's all about tickets. Basically, if you want to talk to somebody, you need to have a valid Kerberos ticket. So the question becomes, uh, where do I get these tickets? Well, you get it from the Kerberos server, which is a service that's probably running on your domain controller. And there are two halves to this Kerberos server. There's the 
authentication server, the AS, and the ticket granting server, TGS. By the way, I'm going to have like a, a visual to make this much easier to understand. So if, so if everything's like going, if, if this is like going over your head, bear with me for just another minute. It gets easier. But anyways, but first it gets harder. So there are two diff different types of tickets. One is called the ticket granting ticket. And this is a ticket that you, will t that you get from the authentication server after, uh, after authenticating. And you will give it to the ticket granting server. The ticket granting server looks at your ticket granting ticket. And, every and if everything looks legit and you're asking for something you're allowed to have, it says, all right, have this ticket so that you can use that service for this amount of time. And you use that ticket to communicate with that service. All right, yeah. So I'm just going to skip to the visualiz visualization real quick. And um, uh, the things are, are done this way because uh, I was told that I suck at, at explaining Kerberos. So I decided to say, fine. And uh, you're going to get a nice little, nice little demo in uh, Linux's equivalent to Paint. So you got your user, this guy right here. <laughs> And he's like, hey, I want to access something on the network. So it goes up to the Kerberos server. This entire, uh, this duo is the entire Kerberos server. Uh, user goes up to the authentication half, auth AS half, no, no, sorry. <laughs> goes up to the AS and is like, hey, this is who I am. Uh, can I please, please give me a ticket? So um, he provides some credentials. He authenticates and the TGD checks out if he's legit, if he's legit. And he's like, all right, cool, you get this. This is for you. And I'll zoom in on this. I know you can't read the text, but I'll show you in just a second. So you get this TGT, nice golden ticket. And so your user's like, cool. And he goes around, and now he's going to visit the TGS. And he's going to give them this uh, golden ticket, this TGT. TGS is going to look at that golden ticket and say, and see if TGS will ask for the golden ticket and then also ask, all right, what, what service you want? And so it's going to read their, their TGT and see if they're allowed to use that service. And if everything looks legit, it will give them another ticket, the service ticket. So the user now has these two tickets, and they get stored in the memory on their computer. And so they're going to take both of these tickets, and they're going to go use that service ticket to talk to the service that they want to uh, talk to. Like, for example, like maybe they're, they're trying to access a network file share or something. And it, so y they would use that uh, ticket to do so. Enough of that. Here's a close up on them. So, you get, so the uh, TGS gave them a TGT. All right, so Olga came up and was like, hey, I want to do things. And TGS was like, all right, authenticate with me. And they authenticate. You get, uh, TGS gives Olga a TGT that lasts for 10 days, and it says, I'm allowed to, she's allowed to use these things. And she's like, cool. And she takes that over to the TGS, the other half of the Kerberos server, and says, hey, can I use, can I do a, use um, that service called uh, mount account? And the TGS is like, mm, looks legit, sounds cool, so, and gives her, gives her that uh, service ticket. And now, all right, much more sophisticated diagram, but one that's very technical and dense. So I'm not going to like walk through all of the steps right here, but uh, this, this will be up on our website for reference if you want to go back and look at it. Basically, this goes more into the cryptographically how is all of that accomplished. But um, I hope that what I explained makes sense and the functions of, of Kerberos is somewhat clear. All right, so you might be asking yourself, why? That sounds really complicated. Why do I want to bother with that? Well, Kerberos is much better than NTLM, and here is why. For one thing, Kerberos supports a stronger encryption algorithms. Even the, mo the latest NTLM uh, uses MD5, right? Yeah, MD5 encryption, and there are better options, you know? Uh, and Microsoft doesn't intend to keep developing with NTLM, doesn't intend to, to update it anymore. They are making the switch towards Kerberos. Um, 
there is less load on the domain controller with Kerberos, with this Kerberos system, because essentially with NTLM, every time you're accessing something, you're going back to the domain controller and saying, hey, can I do this? Here's my hash. On the other hand, Kerberos, once every 10 days or so, you're going to go to that authentication server to get your golden ticket. And then the rest of the time, you're only going to that other half of the uh, Kerberos server. Excuse me. So um, another key nice benefit of Kerberos is that those tickets, they don't last forever. Uh, you can configure it to be different, but by default, they last generally 10 days. Whereas on the other hand, an NTLM hash is valid. It represents that user's password as long as that user has the same password. So that hash is, as, is good as long as they haven't changed their password, which can be a very long time. Oh, and another little thing that I, my uh, little metaphor kind of fails to explain, but the cryptographic side is, is better at explaining, is that uh, Kerberos supports both user-to-server authentication and server-to-user authentication. So not only does the server know that user is definitely who they say they are, uh, the user also knows that this server definitely is what it says it is. On the other hand, NTLM doesn't provide that latter service. They pretty much just the server knows that, that uh, this is a legit user. Oh, also Kerberos is open source. Uh, NTLM is filthy proprietary software. So, yeah. <laughs> Anyways, so uh, now on to the cool stuff, actually attacking authentication, actually hacking domains. And uh, you might have heard of this term before. This is a very big thing, big part of uh, attacking domains is passing the hash. So what does that mean? So I mentioned that uh, because of single sign-on, uh, hashes get left around on, on the domain. So NTLM uh, asks for the user credentials once, uh, hashes the credentials, stores them on the computer. And every other time they try to access something on the network, they're going to just reach into memory, grab that hash, and, and hand it over to the DC. So what that means is that if there is somebody malicious that manages to compromise that computer, and manage to escalate to uh, local admin privileges, they can look at any of the memory they want, and they can see those hashes. They can grab those hashes out of memory. And so that hash is what's used to authenticate, which means that after you have compromised one machine, you can dump all of the hashes that are on it. You can take your favorite one, and you can talk to the rest of the network and pretend to be whoever's hash was on that computer. This is a particularly big deal because Hashes stick around, generally. If, uh, if you get lucky and the local admin had just recently logged on to this workstation, his hash is on that computer. So even so, if this is some, eh, some computer the, the corporation doesn't care about, doesn't care to secure, but the, local, but the uh, domain admin has recently logged in, if it gets compromised, the attacker already has basically credentials to, to authenticate themselves as domain admins. And that's really, really bad. So um, uh, oh, a little uh, disclaimer. Most of the time when you log into a computer, uh, your NTLM hash gets stored on that computer. There are some exceptions, though. There are, Windows has a bunch of different login types. It has nine different types, I think. One of them is called the network type. And most network types don't leave an NTLM hash. Every other type of login uh, will leave that hash. And some types of network logins will leave that, that, uh, that hash, but not all of them. So as I mentioned, uh, Hacker Man gets lucky and finds a domain admin hash on that, that box that they compromised, and GG. Let's say they didn't get that lucky. Well, they still have the, they can authenticate as anyone who's been on that computer recently. Um, so they might, <coughs> so maybe they don't have domain admin, but they have another user who's in another group that's slightly more privileged. Well, then they can take that hash and pivot onto a different part of the network, uh, log into another computer, exploit that one, and dump that one's hashes. So basically, in, a, a lot of penetration tests and attacks against domains involves a user getting access to one computer, dumping these hashes, and just using them to bounce around the network, look, and just dig around in every machine they can get their hands on to look for that really awesome uh, domain admin hash. Yes? It uses, 
That's a, that's a, a great question. It's, it uses Kerberos by default, but that doesn't sound, that, that's not as, that's a little bit misleading, and I'll explain why in just a moment. Um, yeah, yeah, fair. Um, I believe it's, it's, it's since like 2000, server 2008, they started using Kerberos by default, something like that. And then, um, so yeah, I have a little demo for you guys. Uh, one second. Is everything reading? Let me move my hacker machine over here. Some of you might be familiar with Kali. Oh, are you, are you gonna do it? Please, please. There we go, cool. Sorry, one sec. It locked up on me. Um, So basically what I have set up right here, I have taken the trouble to create a virtual Windows domain. So I'm using VirtualBox. I'm using VirtualBox and I have a couple of virtual machines running. One of them is Windows Server 2016, one of them is uh, Windows 10 to serve as my workstation, and one of them is my, my attacker's box. And I've set up a domain so that that Windows Server that Windows Server is running, is uh, acting as the domain controller, and it, that domain, it's a very simple domain. It has one workstation. And what I've gone ahead and do, done beforehand, I'm gonna operate under the assumption that I'm an attacker that's, that's gotten onto that workstation and managed to locally escalate privileges. So I'm going to run a handler, which basically is going to listen for a callback from this machine that I've exploited if it'll do it. What you doing? No. Sorry. This is my IP on this box. OK. And when my exploit runs, hopefully I'll get a shell open on this, this Windows workstation. And there it is. All right. Um, so if I won't go into details on how exactly I, uh, I exploited this machine, I kind of cheaped out. Uh, some of our earlier talks in the semester will cover topics on like how exactly can you exploit some of the configurations on a Windows machine to escalate privileges, that sort of thing. But let's assume I've gotten up to that point, and now I'm on this computer. What's this computer called? It's called Janus. And the computer called Janus has nothing interesting on it at all. Uh, and I'm really disappointed because I just spent like eight hours hacking this this box and there's like nothing cool on here Well, that is why well uh, Attacker is still in luck because with single sign-on past the hashtags I can potentially get to cooler places like the domain controller So this is a interpreter shell. It's a fairly common tool in uh, exploitation and I'm connected to that that workstation. There's some of the information about the uh, the box that I'm currently on, uh, I'm going to load a module called Kiwi. And what Kiwi is, it's just a, a, a little program that looks at the part of memory on this guy's, on Janice's machine, that stores those uh, sensitive hashes. And uh, I'm going to type this in real quick because I need to change, mm, sorry, get UID. So right now my user is local administrator on the Janice machine. Um, this was touched in another uh, talk, but basically there are two local admin accounts on a Windows machine. I need to switch to the other one. And if you have one of them, you basically have the other one. But Meterpreter has a nice, easy built-in to switch over. All right, so now I'm the correct local admin. And I'm going to use this command called creds msv. And look at that. It spits out a bunch of hashes. And so as you guys can see, this is the, uh, the local admin on Janus. This is the hash of their password. But more interestingly, this is the administrator account for the domain Tipsy. And apparently they have logged on to this, or this, uh, this machine recently because their hash is in memory. So what do I do with this? Well, I can take this hash, and I'll demonstrate passing the hash in order to 
open up another shell on the domain controller, which is much more valuable to me than a shell on Janet's computer. So let's background this session real quick. Um, this is a particular, particular module that's very common and easy to use in, in a pass the hash tag. Also, I'll explain this in, well, hang on. Let's see what I need to set up here. SMB user, I'm gonna be the administrator. Uh, anything else? Set, our host, uh, duh, how to type. Our host. I know the DCs, um, uh, IP because I set it up, but there are pretty simple ways to, to grab that sort of thing. Um, and then for that SMB pass field, I'm just going to slap a uh, hash in there and this module is gonna know what I mean. Um, although it's expecting a common, a colon separated value that includes two different hashes, but the first one doesn't matter, which is why I'm doing this. You'll understand in just a second. That's it, SMB pass. Scroll up to this NTLM hash of user tipsy, or sorry, user administrator on the tipsy domain. Now, I think I'm good to go. Uh -huh. Is it gonna do it? It's a little bit finicky because I, I'm sort of stretching my, uh, the limits of what my computer can do because it's running several operating systems at once. So sometimes it's a little bit unreliable. Let's see if you do it. Cool, all right, so I got my other interpreter session. Where am I? I'm on this other computer, DC01, domain controller. Awesome. Who am I? I am the local admin on the domain controller. So basically, I pop one insecure box. Oh, look, I'm lucky I found a hash, and it's that simple to gain complete control over the domain controller. And control over the domain controller is effectively control over the entire domain. So spooky stuff. Anyways, that's enough for the demo for now. Any questions about the demo specifically? Yes. Yes. So um, yeah. So I used that that Kiwi module, ran this command, and it dumped all the hashes that were on the computer. One of them just happened to be the administrator account on this Tipsy domain. I suppose I should have mentioned I named my uh, domain Tipsy. My bad. <laughs> But yeah, so now, uh, and that's how I escalated. Any other questions about the uh, demo before I move over and talk about Kerberos, how it's different and also the same? Yes. Ah, yeah. So basically, this particular module, uh, Windows SMB PS Exec, when you pass it a hash, it's expecting uh, essentially two hashes. One of them is the LM hash, the other one is the NT hash. The LM hash is b for a older deprecated version of NTLM that, the, that, uh, that DC isn't even going to check, so I'm just going to feed it a 32 character gibberish and it doesn't care. And it, what it's go actually going to look at is the, the better, the, NTL, the NT hash, NTLM hash, which is the one that I lifted from the computer. Uh, tip ah, okay. Yeah, this is my fault because I totally misspoke and, and, and didn't tell you guys. So Tipsy is the name of the domain. It refers to all of the uh, network resources that somebody decided to uh, connect together with, this, with one domain. And uh, so this username, this is the, the administrator user of the Tipsy domain. This is the administrator user of the excuse me, the Janus domain, or basically just the Janus machine. This other user 
Um, this is, OK, there is, this indicates to me that there is a user called, I think, uh, Janice. And they have a personal share. Um, and that sort of that service gets its own account on the domain, on the tipsy domain. So that's what that is. Um, I I imagine that's actually a really good question. I'm not sure whether or not uh, it's most likely just the same hash as what she would use to normally log in. Yeah, but I can I can check that if we have time at the at the very end. But yeah. All right. So that was NTLM. You guys, I hope, are convinced that that's bad. That's scary. That you don't want that to happen. Yes. So again, deceptive to say, yes, it uses Kerberos by default. But I just passed an NTLM hash successfully onto a Windows Server 2016, a Windows 2016 server through a workspace that was running Windows 10. So something seems amiss there. And uh, basically, the reason that worked is that, so Microsoft says, yes, we use Kerberos by default. That doesn't mean they've stopped using NTLM. <laughs> for the sake of backwards compatibility, they're going to keep NTLM around on their, their domains for, for probably a while. There are a lot of services that were, a lot of services and softwares that were created with NTLM in, in mind. and. There's just nobody to, say, to update them to be compatible with Kerberos. So instead of hacking off all of those old legacy services, Windows also supports NTLM by default beside Kerberos, uh, unfortunately. This, uh, this was basically straight out of the, uh, the package. Like, my, uh, my Windows server is relatively, I did the minimum I had to. And for the purpose of demonstrating, yes, newest uh, Windows distribution, still, still vulnerable to this stuff. Although, you can go back and configure things to make sure that, you, that NTLM isn't allowed. And uh, whether or not you should do that, I will, I will get to in just a second. So that was a look at NTLM. So does Kerberos save the day? NTLM sounds real bad. Hopefully you guys agree. That was really, that, that's not good stuff. So if, but you know, modern Windows OSs, they use Kerberos by default, so they're safe. No, they're not, unfortunately. Again, NTLM by default runs alongside Kerberos. Those NTLM hashes are still going to be stored and they can still be used and they're still valid on other parts of the domain. Now you can go back and, and like I said, disable all NTLM and make sure everything only uses Kerberos. <laughs> this is a little bit of a hassle and uh, it takes some configuring, but it can be done and s as long as you're okay with losing some of the legacy functionality. Yeah. Um. That's a, that, that, that's a good question. And none are popping up into my head uh, at the moment. But what's, what's uh, important to note, it's, it's not, they're not just thinking about Windows services. They're also thinking about any developers that were trying to make a product that was compatible with Windows. And they, they would say, all right, and, and those developers would, would uh, look at the documentation for NTLM, design their software accordingly to be able to work with NTLM. And maybe they're just not available anymore to update to the the, uh, the newer authentication standard. Also, to fall back, the Kerberos oh, yeah. Kerberos is uh, not the best, but that's why they have Kerberos as a feature. So even if you go through the effort of making sure NTLM, you do not have any NTLM on your, uh, your domain, you're still not safe from past hash. Why? Because Kerberos, it's really great. It's got a lot of benefits over NTLM. Its purpose is not to protect against uh, past the hash attacks. I mentioned before, so you got these tickets and stuff. These things are still stored in memory. So, you can st so if somebody has exported a box, they can still go into memory, grab this TGT, and 
talk to the uh, ticket granting server as though they were the person that they stole the credentials from. It is effectively the same. And while uh, Microsoft will tell you, oh, you, really, you don't see that very often in the wild, that's because you don't generally need to because, it's, because NTLM generally also works. But um, there are already open source tools that will uh, basically do pass the hash with Kerberos, or pass the ticket, as you will. Oops. OK, so there is one, little, one small benefit with regard to pass the hash attacks that Kerberos does give, and that is the fact that those tickets expire after, by default, a couple days. So if you have an attacker that, uh, on an NTLM, that manages to grab an NTLM hash, they, that, they can keep that hash and they can use it for as long as that user doesn't change their password. On the other hand, if they manage to grab somebody's ticket, they can use that for a maximum of 10 days. And uh, so it, it really cuts down on the, the window of opportunity for an attacker, which is, which is nice, but still mm, not foolproof protection by any means. So yeah. So let's talk about a couple of defenses. Yeah. Uh, so, so the benefits other than like the being sort of the security end. The, as I mentioned before, some of the, the benefits might include like um, being able to authenticate both ways. And when you talk to, when, excuse me, when uh, so a user goes and gets a uh, service ticket, it's they now have very granular access. They can access particularly this service for this amount of time. Rather, on the other hand, an NTLM hash says you can authenticate and do whatever you want for as long as this, NT this hash is legit. So if somehow a service ticket got intercepted or something along those lines, uh, it couldn't be used to, it, it, it would be much less critical than intercepting, say, an NTLM hash. Um, okay, so you have GPOs, which will say, which will tell a user, uh, these are the services you can use, and you will use your hash to to uh, um, engage with those services. But that's not that's a little bit different from. Um, sorry, the idea is that. So NTLM network, somebody intercepts the NTLM hash. They can now do anything that that user can do. Uh, Kerberos, you intercept the service ticket. You can now use one of the services that that user can, s can use for a limited amount of time. Yes. For every session, as a matter of fact. Sorry. Yeah. OK. Um, I'm not entirely sure, but I, my, I believe that they generally work on the same server. Cryptographically speaking, I don't think so. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think of any other, like over the wire, don't think so. I'm trying to think of another circumstance. I'll get back to you if I can think of, of, of something. Yeah. Uh, I think so. They're both stored in. A part of Windows OS called the called LSAS, 
And I forget what that acronym stands for, but it is where it stores all the uh, delicate things like hashes and credentials and that sort of thing. It's, it, it's uh, in that same journal space. And uh, yeah. So a couple of defenses. OK, so on the one hand, uh, you should have your solid plan A, which is uh, follow all, the all of the advice that CSG has given you throughout this semester at each of our meetings, which includes keeping things patched, keeping patches up to date, double checking all your configurations to make sure there's not something, a glaring vulnerability, so that somebody could uh, escalate privileges on locally on one of your machines. And furthermore, incorporate your employees into your security team to strengthen your defenses against social engineering attacks. But that isn't enough. If you're a defender, you should absolutely assume that an attacker can get on your network somewhere. Uh, for a very long time, a lot of, def a lot of InfoSec defenders have focused on uh, building up the walls on the outer rim of their network and leaving things vulnerable within. And this has led to very bad things. Uh, you should harden your domain internally. And what does that mean? That means don't leave your hashes laying around. Um, I mentioned that most of the time hashes get left after a login, but some of the time they don't. Th that some of the time encompasses network login sessions, which generally looks like remotely managing uh, computers that you need to that you need an admin to connect to. So rather than going over there and logging in or RDPing and logging in, uh, like maybe use uh, PS Exec without uh, without, what's the word, literal credentials. There's a way to do to set PS exec, exec up such that you can do what you want on on that uh, that remote computer without leaving uh, hashes. Yes. Because, so the thing is, um, those network logins that don't leave hashes, they don't have that benefit that I mentioned toward the very beginning of single sign-on. And so uh, Windows has left a sort of a couple of options for you to not leave a hash at the expense of, all right, you're not going to get that single sign-on experience. Every time you, you remotely uh, PS exec to, to, to do something, it's gonna, I'm going to end up asking you for your password. And that's, that, I think, is a very important option to have. On the other hand, the reason that you have those other type of, of sign-ins uh, that do leave hashes is for the sake of single sign-on, so that you don't need to make all of your users, uh, when they log in every time their computer talks to another computer in the domain, have to make them re-enter their credentials. It's a, it's, it's, super, it's a super handy feature, but it leaves us with this major glaring problem that, we, that uh, has been around for 15 years and uh, needs to be addressed by uh, defenders if you're setting up your own network, your own domain. So um, other ways to harden your domain other than leaving hashes around is that you should fine tune all of the privileges of every computer and every user on your domain, which takes time, admittedly, and can be sort of tedious. But far too often do uh, people get lazy and sort of decide, you know, I don't want to figure out what exactly Apache needs in order to run. I'm going to let it run as admin, which is a terrible idea because now if there's any flaw, any exploit in in that uh, Windows ser that server that service that somebody uh, exploits, they have they instantly have admin. Uh, it is worth taking the time and deciding and figuring out what does this this service and this user need exactly, and limit to only limit their privileges to only what they need to do their job. Uh, so yeah. Does, does the IT intern at your company really need Omega Super Admin privileges? Probably not. And uh, one, one other thing that about hardening your domain that I want to hit on is that you, can, that you should definitely isolate critical components. So if you have machines that are definitely going to have those critical uh, admin hashes, for example, a workstation for your, your IT admins, then isolate those things. Um, do your best, may maybe put them on a separate VLAN if possible. Uh, don't maybe restrict their internet access. Maybe, um, like, do they really need email for the account that has super omega admin access? 
you know, why not set up a separate lower privilege account so that they can deal with that? That sort of thing. And uh, for the sake of time, I'm not going to dive too f far into future technologies. So pass the hash attacks have been around for like 15 years, and uh, they are prevalent in the current average Windows domain. However, Windows relatively recently has been coming up with some new um, technologies that they plan to roll out, which may potentially help address some of these attacks. One of them is Windows Advanced Threat Protection, and that link is to a, I, I think, a very nice Black Hat talk about, uh, from an attacker's perspective, looking at uh, Windows ATP. And although he'll be like, ah, this is how you break it, he does a really good job of showing how much harder ATP is going to make an attacker's life. And then another technology that I want to mention is Credential Guard, which is, uses some uh, uses virtualization to try to protect that part of memory that has those critical hashes. But uh, yeah. So? One thing you didn't speak about, and I know this is more for the product forward, but it seems like if you were to change, let's say you have a very small list of domain admins, mm -hmm. maybe one, administrator, or whatever you choose to call it. If you change the password every day, that limits to a 24 hour window how long it would have to be valid running around any other machine. Absolutely. This so is there anything out there that's open source or free that will make password validity or daily and you can access the password even when you need it? That's a that's that's a good question. I'm gonna refer to I got you. Yeah. Um so I don't know if it has that full credential functionality, uh, but HackerCorp has some really cool stuff. And that is a password store and you could relatively easily develop a service around Vault to do that. So Vault is a distributed hashing store that's designed for authentication. 